Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, Mario, and thank you, Benoit. So it's a pleasure and it's an honor to be here for Benoit's Farewell Conference. And before we get into serious matters, I would like to share with you a few personal thoughts about Benoit. So Benoit is what we call in French a humanist. He combines the highest scientific formation with the widest appetite for literature I'm sure most people could not recognize the authors that were on their name table yesterday. He speaks Japanese, he climbs mountains, he smokes cigars, he loves opera, he writes books, he will do another one with his speeches here, he collects art, um, but above all, Benoit is a truly faithful and generous friend, as you can all testify here. And I think on top of this, <laughs> He has the unique quality of having always combined freedom and responsibility in his professional life. So Benoit, you're only in the middle of your career. And as we discussed many times, you've barely reached your productivity peak. Since, as you know, the 50s is the new 40s. And given what you have achieved in barely 20 years, I'm not sure we have enough imagination to picture what you will do over the next 21. Now, as you often say, there's no free lunch or rather dinner. So we are here to talk about the role of the bond market in the conduct of monetary policy. As Mario just alluded, bond markets provide indicators of financial condition, inflation expectations and perception of risks. And these indicators are based on the analysis of the current and future economic outlook, their understanding of central bank economic views and reaction function. These financial conditions therefore depend significantly on the quality of communication between central banks and markets. So now communication has not always been prominent among central bankers and I will read you a little extract from a discussion between Keynes and Harvey who was deputy governor of the Bank of England, hi John, in 1929. So Keynes, is it a practice of the Bank of England never to explain what its policy is? Harvey, well I think it has been our practice to leave our actions to explain our policy. Keynes, or the reasons for its policy, Harvey, or oh, it's a dangerous thing to start giving reasons. Kent, or to defend itself against criticism, Harvey. As regards criticism, I'm afraid, so the committee may not all agree, we do not admit here there is a need for defense. To defend ourselves is somewhat akin to a lady starting to defend her virtue. Now, modern central bankers have moved way beyond this and communicate through policy statements and press conferences and economic forecasts, official reports, speeches, interviews, testimonies before public bodies. You might argue this is too much. However, the better markets understand how the central bank will react to the state of the economy to enforce an event, the better they anticipate policy action. In an optimal world, conditions in financial markets should timely and gradually tighten or loosen as economic news suggests changes in the economic state of the world, anticipating the central bank reaction. And this is particularly relevant in the post-crisis and conventional monetary policy world we are living in today. Um, so because it is Benoit, we have to, say, to quote a lot of academics um, and I will start with one which is Gertson and Woodford in 2003 who have demonstrated that effective communication is especially powerful in a global environment of low nominal rates and reduced policy space because it can reduce the size of central bank interventions required to achieve desired financial conditions. Effective communication may be also particularly important when there are a lot of risk accumulated in markets. In that case, central banks may wish to minimize volatility when financial markets adjust to changes in economic condition and therefore monetary policy action. There are also reasons to worry about excess communication. 
And that has to do in a way with the personal nature of monetary policy and financial market dialogue. Now, as Jeremy here and Yun Xin here expressed in previous occasions, the market is not a single person and the Central Bank Committee is not a single person either. But markets can only adjust in line with central bank expectations if they understand correctly the signals sent by the central bank persons. There also must be a certain degree of latitude so that both financial market and central banks can adjust to the state of the economy without triggering large movements of volatility that would destabilize financial conditions and in turn the real economy. So altogether, too much information, especially when there are different opinions coming from one committee, may result in conflicting signals about the policy path. The famous blinder, second quote, 2007, cacophony of voices. And that may increase uncertainty for markets and private agents. But there is an additional concern about communication, which is that it goes both way. And I'm sorry to quote you a second time, but as you said before, there is the talking part and there is the listening part. So that if central bank took more to influence market prices, there may be an argument that they should perhaps listen less to signals emanating from the same markets. And I quote you, in a echo, otherwise the central banks can find themselves in an echo chamber of their own making, acting on signals that are echoes of their own pronouncement. And even more monetary policy relies on and influence market signals, so the circularity between monetary policy and market reactions may amplify a bad signal, and this can in turn unduly constrain policy action if the central bank fears, then when it deviates from market expectation, it will create strong volatility. So perhaps this is what Benoit wanted to signal with his session today, if we can take any clue from one of his 180 or so speeches in Burgos in 2017, where he quoted Paul Samuelson, who famously compared the central banker who reads too much for movements in the bond market to a monkey who discovers his reflection in the mirror and thinks that by looking at the reactions of that monkey, including its surprises, he's getting new information. However, one could argue that central banks always have the opportunity to look at an extended set of signals way beyond the bond market. And this is the last point I will make because you're here to listen to Hélène, Charles and Jeremy. Obviously, the clearest forward guidance would be a fully transparent algorithm that relates interest rate to economic data. But to date, such a mechanical reaction function only exists in economic models, and policymakers have to use their judgment, manage their decision, and that's inherently uncertain. Benoit, you may be working on such an algorithm in your future life, but in the meantime, I think we have to leave Jeremy Charles and Elaine debate the dialogue between central banks and markets and hopefully disentangle what is the reality of this dialogue from the mythological part Marvid Goodfriend analyzed. Thank you. And you start. Okay, well, first, thanks, thanks very much, Laurence, and uh, it's just a privilege to be uh, a, a part of honoring Benoit for his extraordinary public service. Um, and I just want to thank him personally for, for the example he set um, for how to combine the best economic thinking with a deep understanding of markets and institutions and really principled policymaking. It's, it's been an honor to watch and to, to, to learn from our, our interaction. So thank you. Um, thank you, Benoit. So what I, what I thought I would do is, is touch on one particular aspect of, uh, of the, the panel's topic, um, namely the consequences and potentially the dysfunctional consequences of central banks being overly attentive to, to how markets receive their words and actions. So I'm going to try and speak specifically to the monkey in the mirror um, uh, uh, issues that were that that Laurence just uh, just flagged. So um, 
let's see, the slides got a little cut off here. But uh, so you know, when I when I first came to the Fed, I have to say one of the one of the things that was most surprising to me was this. So of course, I understood that the markets pay enormous attention, not only to the actions, but to every word, to how the statement is being changed, to all that. I understood that. What I didn't fully appreciate was the other side of this monkey feedback loop, was just how attentive the, the Fed, and I think central banks in general, are to what the market is thinking about what they're thinking. Um, and so one of the things that struck me as particularly odd about our practice, I don't know if it's exactly the same at the ECB, is at the beginning of every FOMC meeting, the first thing we would have is a report from the desk in New York where they've done a survey of market participants, and the market participants tell us what they think we're going to do. So you know, during the, the bond buying era, there would be a survey that says, what are, you, what are the probability you attach uh, to the likelihood that the Fed will taper asset purchases at this meeting? Market participants would say, it's highly unlikely, you know, 5% probability. And then you sometimes felt like QED, you know, this is, they've, they've decided we're not going to taper at this meeting. Then obviously if we taper at this meeting, uh, we'll have shocked the market and that's a bad, and so, you know, that, that's um, I, you know, something that struck me as odd. And, uh, I, you know, in, in the years since, have tried to think about it a little bit more formally, have done some modeling work, and, you know, if you think about it, the sort of two key ingredients in thinking about this problem are, one, you have to believe that the Fed has some information about its own intentions, its own actions. That sort of just means that the market reacts to the Fed, and or I should say the central bank, excuse me, and, uh, and uh, second, that there is a concern, and this is, this is where you know, we get into kind of the, the difficult thing, that there's a concern on the part of the central bank with the market volatility response to its, uh, to its words and actions. And if I could leave you with one sort of overarching idea from this, it's that that mix of ingredients gives rise to a time consistency problem. So we're very, everybody in this room is familiar with the idea of time consistency problems in central banking, typically around inflation. And we sort of understand the idea of pre-commitment or of culture in the sense of, you know, you know that when you become a central banker, you're supposed to hate inflation, right? Because what we've learned from this time consistency problem is you actually get a better outcome in terms of both inflation and output or inflation and unemployment if you commit yourself or if you build a culture that is particularly worried about inflation, okay? What I think is less appreciated is a, is a somewhat analogous time consistency problem, which is even if there is some legitimate reason to care about the market, it can be important to build a culture around or a set of norms around not behaving as if you're too worried about the market response to your words and actions. So that, that's the basic idea. And the, you know, the flip side of that is if you are too sensitive to the market, you can get a variety of sort of dysfunctional um, dysfunctional outcomes. So I'll try, to, I'll try to mention a couple. One is this well-known um, uh, idea of gradualism in monetary policy, where even when the world changes, when fundamentals change, the central bank often wants to move in very, very small steps. Um, but there are other examples, uh, one, one being sort of this, this being led by the market phenomenon that, that, that Laurence alluded to, where market sentiment shifts and basically, or the market expectations about the, the central bank shift, and the central bank, in order not to disappoint the market, feels like it has to go along. Where there's some, and that's the thing I, I felt quite keenly myself, some loss of agency uh, in terms of your policy because you're being led by, by the market. So um, here's just a dopey thing you can do with the transcripts. Um, this is just a little exercise we did where we counted, very, very uh, simple thing, we counted the number of times in the transcripts people alluded to financial markets, said words like bond market or bond market volatility, and then just divided by the total number of words in the transcript. And you can sort of see the pattern. Obviously, it goes up and down, not surprisingly at all. Around the financial crisis, people are talking about financial markets a lot. But even if you filter out these sort of ups and downs, there's a very strong time trend here that basically this fitted value, the red line, goes up by a factor of something like five. So the idea that central bankers are not only concerned but have been, become more concerned in recent years uh, with markets seems to be there in a very, very crude um, cut at the data. Um, as I said, you know, uh, it's a very well-known fact uh, that, that uh, the funds, you know, the, that, that uh, policy rates adjust relatively inertially to changes in what you might think are the sort of uh, fundamental 
uh, targets. You know, here's a picture of the funds rate during a hiking cycle. You know, what if they went 17 times in the same, in the same direction? You sort of kind of knew where they were going, but they somehow wanted to get there slowly. Uh, we have a quote here from Alan Greenspan, which basically kind of captures, I think, the intuition. We don't want to create discontinuous movements in, in asset prices. But note the, the sort of conundrum here, or the, 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 the paradox. It's just like companies that smooth their earnings. They think, oh, if we have smooth earnings, we won't have a volatile stock price. But of course, the market comes to understand that you're smoothing your earnings. So then if you miss your earnings target by even a penny, it becomes a big deal. Same thing, the market understands that you're moving gradually. So then everything you do is freighted with significance. Even if you don't move at all, but you change the statement, that in itself becomes a thing. And so it's hard to make the volatility go away. And at the end of the day, what you're left with is very gradual adjustment, but probably not a whole lot less market volatility, just greater market sensitivity to a given small movement. And maybe, as in the case with this sort of very, the policy rate is just not really where you want to be. Right? You've sort of smoothed. You haven't really accomplished anything, but you've ended up a little bit further than, 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 than where you want to be. So again, that's just one example of, of, of something that can happen when you're, when you're too focused on, on, on markets. Um, but there are others. You know, we talk so much about data dependence. And at some level, it's like motherhood and apple pie. How can you not want to be data dependent? But I think sometimes in this sort of loop with the market, you can get a particular kind of data dependence, which seems a little odd and a little dysfunctional, which is an obsession with the most recent number. And again, you, you know, you, I, I, everybody in this room has probably seen or, or felt some example of this. But, but the one that sort of like left an impact on me is, you know, we'd, we'd be kind of running up to a meeting. And there was kind of a default decision. Maybe we'll taper at this meeting, or maybe we'll raise rates. But the market somehow gets it in its head that you know, the central bank is very data dependent. And boy, the payroll number that comes out on the Friday before the meeting is a big deal. And the market's conjecture, in some sense, is if that payroll number is not good, where good means something like 200,000, they're going to step back and not do it at this meeting. Okay? Then you find yourself praying to the god of measurement error and say, you know, boy, I hope we don't get a flaky number, because it's self-validating. I mean, we had one of these where I think we were about to taper. Uh, this is September of 2013, I think, and we're basically set to go, and the number comes out, and the number is not 200, maybe it was like 170 or something like that. And of course, you know, and I know, and we all know that there's no meaningful difference between 170 and 200 in one number. But if the market thinks that's your rule, and now the market going into the meeting is thinking they're not going to do it, and you know the evidence is, and the Goldman Sachs has produced this kind of research, very, very un, uh, unusual for the Fed to make a tightening move that is not fully baked into market expectations at the time. So what do you get? The, the market's conjecture, in some sense, is validated. They hold fire um, when, the number is, um, when the number is a little disappointing. So one response to this is, uh, you know, I think one thing that's constructive, the problem here is if meetings are always kind of a jump ball. If it's always just hanging in the balance, that's when it's most freighted with informational content. So the problem, you know, the sort of theory would tell you, you want to take some of the informational content out. So in some cases, you can't always do this. But in some cases, to the extent that it's possible to have a default presumption. So what I mean is, you know, it's not hanging exactly in the balance, but sort of there's an expectation that as long as the data is broadly between say the 25th and the 75th percentile, this is what we're going to do. That makes it easier to implement the policy. So a particular example is, again, when the, the Fed first started thinking about tapering, it was just an enormous big deal, right? There was the taper tantrum. Every little signal was a big deal. Then we sort of happened our way into something which I think was maybe a little invertent, but was helpful, which is that the assumption started to be that once we started to taper, that at every meeting, Afterwards, we were going to do $10 billion more. Well, you know, of course, unless something dramatic happened. But there was a sort of a notion that for a broad set of outcomes, we would kind of uh, do this $10 billion a meeting. Well, then when you do it, there's no information content, so it's easy to do. Similarly, sometimes in a hiking cycle, you can find yourself in a situation where you can create a default, which is as long as nothing too dramatic happens. Right? And that's helpful. Whereas if you set each meeting up as this super data dependent thing, you can get yourself, I think, a little bit, bit trapped. And, it, and this is just something that comes out of this way of thinking that the underlying problem 
is this kind of market inference about your private information, and then what you want to do is in some sense take some information content out. Um, last, okay, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I guess I should, I should, uh, I should cut. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, one minute. One minute. Okay. So let me just say, the one, the one sort of tension in this that, that is it's sort of very apparent that I, I'm sort of very aware of is, you know, I'm a believer, I know a lot of other people in this room are believers that at some low frequency, at some low frequency, we should pay attention to financial conditions. That is to say, if financial conditions are, you know, tighter this year than they were last year, we should have an easier policy setting. And at the same time, I guess I'm trying to say we should really try to create a culture and a set of norms where we don't worry too much about the short-run impact on markets. Now, you might say that those things are at least partially in contradiction with one another. And in a random walk world, after all, the long run is just the sum of a bunch of short runs. So how can you believe both of these things? You know, there is some tension. I will say that tension is mitigated to the extent that the market impact of a policy announcement is somewhat transitory. And the recent evidence is, is, is somewhat consistent with, with that. So, you know, makes it a little easier to say, I'm not going to be overly concerned with market impact because often the market impact of a Fed announcement tends to revert away in the sort of six to, to nine months afterwards. Thanks. 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 I'm sorry we had to cut you off sorry, sorry, sorry. when you were just about to give some insight on the taper tantrum, no. but we'll come back to this. <laughs> uh, and I think Charles is supposed to offer a little contradictory view to Jeremy. All right. Um, well, it's a, it's a great uh, privilege and a great pleasure uh, to be here today to uh, honor the, the work that uh, Benoit has been doing here. Uh, lots of people have, are claiming to have known him for a long time. Uh, I probably knew him for longer than most people. Uh, I knew him when he was a graduate student uh, in Paris. And uh, he was not just a good graduate student, he was an unusually good and unusual person. Uh, I don't know how many people know it, but he's, he speaks and reads, or at the time he used to speak and read in Japanese. Uh, for a young graduate student in economics, it was unusual. And I also discovered uh, one morning when he came to visit us uh, in my home that he can uh, draw beautifully well. Uh, he has a, a talent for that and probably a, a training. Uh, and of course, he was, he was unusually uh, thoughtful. So uh, it's been pleasure, uh, a pleasure for me all over this year to follow uh, his uh, blossoming. Uh, and, and his blossoming was actually successive transformations. Uh, he went to work, uh, of course, with the, in the Treasury, where he held a different position. And each time, uh, I discovered somebody getting bigger uh, and more thoughtful. Um, and uh, of course, uh, when he came to the ECB, it was another, another new life for him. Uh, and uh, he's done, obviously, very well. Uh, I've been wondering why, why has he been so successful in everything he's done? Uh, well, of course, he's good and he's well trained. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that we all know. Uh, but I think what is unusual is the degree to which he takes uh, science seriously. Uh, he, he just reads everything uh, and uh, he thinks very hard about it and then he comes to his uh, conclusion. And uh, again, Mario mentioned it, uh, uh, the, the, the many speeches that uh, he has been giving uh, over the time. Uh, I've been addicted to these speeches, uh, not just because he mentions everything that I haven't read. Uh, so I feel I have read them after he talks about it. Uh, but also each one of them has a little uh, personal touch and, and, and a useful contribution and an idea that uh, obviously I didn't have before. So uh, very, very successful. And it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, we were discussing uh, about uh, jokes, about, uh, about Benoit. Actually, it's very hard. 
uh, to remember jokes. He is full of humor and he, he, about lots of things, but he doesn't open himself up easily uh, to humorous remarks. So uh, I, I won't go into more private things. Uh, <laughs> I just stay here. Uh, now, on the topic of today, we have to be a little bit serious. Uh, again, this is a topic, as Mario mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, Benoit has, has been thinking very hard and made some very interesting contribution. Uh, so I've been asked to discuss that, and I feel humbled. This is one of the many cases where the student is better than the teacher. Uh, so I, I'll try to do a little bit of provocation. Uh, following on, on, on many of the things that uh, Jeremy has said. And you'll cut me off when I've uh, reached uh, one-tenth of my presentation. Uh, uh, now, uh, okay, Th there is this, this hypothesis uh, that monetary policy has been uh, important. Uh, of course, that's the provocation because you don't come in this house uh, and make this statement uh, that's, that's certainly uh, not what, what is uh, the rule of, of the house. Uh, now, still, th there is this huge paradox that we all know that how the central banks have sold the world after the crisis and ever since for the last 10 years, they seem to be unable to bring inflation to a very moderate level. And that was supposed to be the easiest thing. And uh, at least uh, I've been in these people, in this generation who uh, thought the problem is not to raise uh, the price inflation, but to keep it from, from exploding. Uh, so so why, why do we have that? And that's where I'll, I'll link up with the financial market. Um, we, we had this low for long interest rates, and, they, and, and there are a number of discussions about uh, this creating uh, distortions. Uh, it was mentioned before that uh, there is this uh, assumption, hypothesis that there is a reversal rate, and the reversal rates may be creeping up over time. Uh, so it may be around the corner now. Um, there is this view that QE doesn't work anymore uh, because there is so much liquidity because of all these distortions. Uh, and, uh, and there is this view, so, so low or negative interest rates, QE and forward guidance were the big non-standard contributions of the last 10 years, and now there is this view, none of these things are, are helpful anymore. Uh, and then there is this view that forward guidance is just not anchoring anymore uh, inflation expectations. So we have, we have all these assumptions which are being discussed, uh, and uh, I, what I want to do is to, to, to link it with the financial markets a little bit. Uh, my perception, I may be, I'm surely wrong, is that financial markets like uh, the current situation of QE and forward guidance and low interest rates. Low interest rates are not for banks maybe, but for financial markets are, are mostly good news. Uh, low borrowing costs, uh, great asset valuations, uh, so more uh, the, the value of funds under management is very high. Uh, QE, lots of liquidity to absorb and, 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 and take care of, so it's good business. Uh, and forward guidance is great because the, it, it limits uh, market uncertainty, which is what markets hate. So maybe in a way uh, what uh, is trouble for central bank is mostly good news for financial market. That's sort of my provocation. Uh, now, there's the, the, the question is, it's maybe too good to give up, so do the financial markets hold the central banks captive? And, uh, and in a way, uh, Jeremy has already developed the, the argument saying, yes, sometimes we, talking when he was in a central, a central banker, uh, we, we, we may get scared of, of uh, rowing against the, the tide of the market. Now, here this Jeremy has said, uh, this is the, the part about expectations, so I'll save time and get a bit later by just saying uh, the, the, there are a number of ways in which markets influence central banks. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, central banks, and this also some, Mario said, central banks will try to shape expectations. Now, 
expectations. What I think is, 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 is amazing how markets get it totally wrong most of the time. Not all of the time, but most of the time. This is um, about the US, the Fed. Uh, you have the interest rates and you have expectations uh, over time extracted from uh, financial uh, market pri from market prices. And uh, not all the time, but very often, markets just get it awfully wrong. Uh, that's about the, the policy rate. Uh, here about inflation, and that's a picture I stole from, from Benoit himself. Uh, w w this is inflationary uh, expectations, so the previous one with interest rates. This is inflationary expectations in Europe. Uh, and uh, and uh, so you have the actual inflation rate and uh, in red and in green you have uh, market expectations. Uh, again, in, in, in presenting this figure, this uh, figure, Benoit was, was right in saying, well, we, we at the ECB, we also got, get it wrong often, so it's not just blaming the market. But the point, and I don't want to blame anybody, the point I, wait, I want to make here is that all these communication strategies trying to improve uh, the perceptions of the markets, which in turn may be forcing the hands sometimes of central banks. And it's just amazing uh, the, the, the amount of mistake uh, that's, that's in, in this built up in, the, in these expectations. And then if you buy the argument this is influencing the central bank, there's something to be worried about. This is another uh, thing about uh, market expectations about euro interest rates in the eurozone following the September decision. Uh, I don't know if the central bankers here have seen that. This is scary. Uh, the, the market expect that by next July, 58% uh, uh, of market perception is that the interest rate will be minus 0.7%. Zero, uh, 0 uh, will be lowered by, uh, no, will be lowered to minus 0 0.7 percent. So there is this pressure, uh, majority of markets expecting things. We know it's wrong, but then the, the central bank has to think about it. And, uh, and the market is, is pretty insistent in its own expectations. So here I picked up uh, the Financial Times just before the historical uh, meeting of the uh, ECB uh, Governing Council in, in September two th 2009. And uh, so, so this is an illustration of the kind of pressure that I, I perceive central bankers are on, and Jeremy sort of uh, accepted that. Uh, so uh, ECB's Draghi faces up to supercharged market expectation, just a, a kind of, work t of warning. And then there's lots of interviews of uh, financial market participants, they must be important enough to be quoted by the FT. Uh, so one says QE infinity is beyond is what the market wants. I think people have bought these bonds because they expect to be able to sell them to the central bank. So that's what I think the market wanted to, the statement about the market wanted to see. You could see a market tantrum once the significance of that sinks in. It's another one, but it's a warning. If you don't do what we want, uh, you'll see a market tantrum. And then there is a clear risk that there could be disappointment, so they are a bit realistic. If there is no discussion or mention of the issue of limits, uh, QE limits, the market will take that very negatively. So here is the warning, and then the poor guys meet, uh, and they have to make a completely independent decision. Uh, uh, so clearly, time. OK, uh, then if it's time, if it's time, I just want to go to, uh, uh, well, I want to pick up one issue about the ECB, if I may. Um, the, so under this pressure, what I was going to say is that under this pressure, of course, this affects uh, communications, this occasionally affects decisions. I want to go back to one aspect of the ECB, uh, just because there will be a strategy review. I want to mention something. Um, we, the, the, the treaty says that the governing councils decide by voting. As far as I can understand, it never votes. Uh, so the idea is consensus and so on and so forth. Uh, and one reason for that is, of course, is fear of markets. Uh, this idea of cacophony, so if we start saying uh, we, we don't disagree, 
I think there is something deeply wrong with that. Given that the markets are never happy enough and never convinced enough, I think there is some serious thinking to be done about uh, having frank discussions, having votes, and even statements that don't disagree the market. I mean, essentially what, what Jeremy was saying, the more you give information to the market, the more the le le next tiny bit of information will be exploited, the signal e extraction. Uh, there may be so room, some room of giving more uncertainty, more uncertainty to, to the market, because that's the way the world is, and it may be helpful. Uh, now, let, uh, oops, yeah, the last thing I wanted to say, uh, we no, 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 about no. Infra okay no okay I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> on, on top of this, I think we should we should give the first question afterwards to the market uh, because some of it is there. Elaine, please. Thanks a lot. It's a great privilege to be, to be here today. And it's been a great privilege to discuss economics with Benoit uh, over the years. Benoit has had uh, a lot of involvement with the academic community. And I know it's uh, going to sound as very self-serving, but I do think it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I uh, benefited greatly from his insights, uh, his speeches, over short talks, about long discussions. Uh, such as uh, last summer when Benoit and I and a few other people in this room were lost for uh, many hours in the woods uh, around uh, Jackson Hall and had the chance to talk about deep matters. And as the sun uh, was going down, nobody panicked, and certainly not Benoit. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of a different perspective here uh, on the topic. So uh, my two uh, friends here on the panel have uh, talked a lot about the effect on market, on, uh, on central bank behavior. And I'm going to look more at the central bank uh, monetary policy effect on uh, market risk aversion. And uh, I will look at that mainly through uh, the idea that uh, central banks affect uh, risk aversion in particular through the effect uh, they have on uh, financial intermediation. So that's going to be my, my angle. And I will look at the international aspect mainly, because that's what I've been doing some research about. So if we, if we look at the effect of a Fed tightening, uh, this is well known now on, um, on global risk aversion in, market, in markets. So you see here 100 basis point tightening. Uh, this has uh, the effect of appreciating the dollar, that's the first panel, decreasing uh, risky asset prices around the world, that's the second panel, and increasing global risk aversion, that's the third panel. Uh, to give you an order of magnitude, this uh, global factor decrease corresponds to roughly a 10 points decrease in a broad stock market indices. So these are big, uh, big effects. Now, uh, if you look at very different measures of, of risk aversions, they, this, they tell broadly the same story. So if we look at the effect of a tightening uh, directly on the VIX, uh, this is the, the first panel. You see it goes up on impact. Uh, you see that these various other measures of risk aversions go up on impact, essentially, uh, when there is monetary policy tightening. Now, uh, of course, these... Uh, this interaction between monetary policy, liquidity, and risk aversion uh, is a topic that has been of interest for a while. And as a matter of fact, the first speech that Benoit gave in 2012 was precisely about these issues. Um, so I'm, I'm quoting here, the procyclicality of credit liquidity is documented via the strong interaction of private liquidity and the global risk appetite of financial institutions. Indeed, the global risk appetite is one of the main determinants of a multiplier that links level of overall liquidity to levels of official liquidity. There is a self-reinforcing interaction between risk appetite and liquidity. So that was uh, 2012. So of course, then uh, Benoit moved on to do these 174 other speeches on many different topics. I got stuck on these things for like the next five years or six years <laughs> working on these issues. And so what are the, um, the effects that uh, uh, that we can think about what are the mechanisms uh, linking um, you know, liquidity and monetary policy uh, to these uh, risk aversion measures of the markets and, and how do they work. So I think there are two main uh, channels here. The balance sheet effect, which is, uh, for example, discussed by Andrew Crockett in, in 2001, simply about the fact that 
when uh, the interest rate is low, asset valuations look good. So balance sheets, everything, all the balance sheets look good. And so the, in turn, this stimulates more liquidity creation, more credit creation, and that uh, increase valuations further. And, and, and that's a, a, a kind of reinforcing uh, effect on, uh, on financial markets here. Uh, I think there's also another effect, which is, so, so the balance sheet effect can be maybe thought about more like, a, like an intensive uh, margin effect. There's another effect, which is a composition effect in the financial sector. Uh, more risk-taking intermediaries actually um, may take more or less prominent, prominence over time, depending on uh, macroeconomic conditions, on regulatory conditions, depending in particular also on the level of interest rate. And uh, by uh, being the marginal prices of assets in various markets, they are the ones who can uh, shape uh, the time variation in, uh, in global risk aversion. So there's a composition effect there, which I think is important. That means that in both cases, whether you think of it as a the balance sheet effect or a composition effect, actually uh, the fact that uh, asset pricing is, uh, uh, to a large extent, I think, dia due to financial intermediation, uh, that means that asset prices are going to be very influenced by the characteristics of the intermediaries which are prominent in the market, whether they are insurance or asset managers or whether they are banks, it's going to matter. Whether their value at risk constraints is very tightened or not, regulatory issues, that's going to matter. And on this set of, um, of uh, uh, financial intermediary asset pricing ideas, there's very interesting new work done by Ralph Kojan and Moto Yugo, for example, where they analyze uh, very granular data uh, to give us some insight about the effect of these different financial intermediaries on asset pricing. Now, uh, how does that play out? Well, for example, in the past, if we look back at these years between 2003 and 2000. Uh, seven. So there, there's a case to be made that risk aversion was very much shaped by the rise and fall of global banks. Uh, here you see the influence of uh, uh, banking flows. This is the dark blue in cross-border flow. You see that there is a lot of uh, volatility coming from these flows and that global banks were really becoming important uh, up, to, to, up to the crisis. Now, if uh, they are relatively uh, risk takers, that's going to shape risk aversion. Uh, the market is going to be less risk averse during those years. And this is, I think, probably this contributed to, uh, uh, to the buildup of risk in the global economy. These days, if asset managers are becoming more important, then it's going to be more important to study the institutional constraints of, of asset managers. Now, within banks, uh, I'm just going to show you here a little, it's almost like a cartoon. I'm going to show you. Uh, so you see on the vertical axis, you have leverage of uh, banks. This is taken from the Bankscope data, so this is all monetary and financial institutions. On the horizontal axis, you have asset quantiles. So if you go to the right, these are the big banks, okay? And to the left, these are the smaller ones. And this is going to be year by year, so the distribution of leverage by asset quantiles. Each point is about 30 banks. So you see bigger banks tend to be more leverage. That's the first uh, <laughs> Uh, information of, of this thing. Yes, it's pretty. Uh, but what is interesting is the time variation. So wait, Benoit, it's the <laughs> time variation. So look, look at it. So this is 2003, 2004. This is the same scale on the uh, vertical axis, 2005, 2006. Wow. So you see this skewness going up on the, on, the, on the right tail, right? So you see the increase in market share in a way of, um, of uh, what I would say the most risk-taking intermediary. So this is the time variation in this, which I think can be connected to the fact that when there is a boom, the more risk-taking players tend to actually increase their market share, and, and, and then they are going to price assets more, and this is the connection with, uh, with the global risk aversion. After the crisis, I'm going to sh show you just two years, we, we tend to go down, and this is due to the conditions, but also this is due to re-regulation, right? So, okay. Now, how does that, uh, again, um, uh, play out in a, in a more broad setting. So if we think about uh, the transmission of US monetary policy to the global economy, so I extracted here a few panels from the VAR, but I would like you to focus on these two ones. Again, it's a, it's a Fed tightening, and look at the effect of a Fed tightening on the world financial conditions or the global factor in asset prices. Very strong, okay? So the transmission through financial markets of, of, of the Fed seems to be pretty strong. You see that the second panel, which I haven't underlined, is the world trade. There is an effect on world trade as well. Um, but we are going to compare that 
with the People's Bank of China uh, International Monetary Policy Transmission, which is some ongoing work I'm looking at right now. And there, what is interesting is that if you have a tightening of the People's Bank of China, the world financial conditions of a global factor, certainly on impact, they don't move. Okay, so, so it's, it's not a transmission via financial markets, it looks like, okay, everything, you know, it's, 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 it's work that, uh, that I'm currently doing, so, but uh, that's what we see. But however, wh where the People's Bank of China seems to have a big impact is the world trade, right, and, and the world production. So it's more of a real transmission uh, side here. So this means uh, there is this heterogeneity in international transmission channels uh, of, of monetary policy. From the Fed, it looks like we look more at the, at the global financial cycle, uh, but also some effects on the trade cycle. From the People's Bank of China, it looks much more on the, uh, on the real side and on, on the trade side. Now, this is important because this, these are very different types of spillovers, right? So on the one side, you have spillovers through asset pricing spreads, and, and therefore this has to do then with possibly with financial stability issues, etc. On the other side, you have terms of trade, commodity prices. This also will lead to wealth transfers, which can be very important, and, and to disruption in pattern of capital flows as well that may play out later. But on impact, uh, the financial variables are moving mostly, it seems, because of the Fed. So uh, to conclude, because I'm at the end, uh, I think, uh, of course, <laughs> the next step, uh, which is going to be fascinating, is to study the style of the ECB in terms of international uh, transmission. Uh, so, to some extent, the URI is a little bit in between uh, the Fed and, uh, and, and the People's Bank of China in the sense that euro area capital markets are still underdeveloped compared to the US one. The international role of the euro is still limited compared to the dollar. However, the EU is a trading power, a big one. Euro invoicing is a little bit less important than dollar invoicing. So it will be very interesting to see how it plays out in these various types of potential spillovers from the ECB. So one can uh, study this using similar methodologies, which uh, you know, uh, I'm hoping many people will, will try to, to do that, and I will certainly try as well. Uh, but I would like to, to end by uh, citing Benoit in, again in a, in a recent speech at the Paris School of Economics, where he said, first, uncertainty is a pervasive feature of our profession. Second, perhaps the defining challenge for our profession is that our understanding of the economy is never settled. And third, there are no settled answers to applied questions. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I'm not going to conclude anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks, Elena, and thanks for being so respectful of time. Um, yeah. This is a perfect transition with what I was thinking about Charles' presentation. Isn't it that just we economists always get it wrong? <laughs> um, I think that was a perfect demonstration. I have a lot of questions, but I think it would be better if we, if we get somebody from financial markets to react to what we've been saying. They usually are not so shy. <laughs> if I may. Okay, Jean. I'm very shy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> um, there we are. Firstly, um, I really welcome Jeremy Stein's remarks. I mean, I think it's. Uh, you know, from someone who is, has watched, interacted, transacted in markets for 25 years, um, you know, starting in 1994 when one of the first big uh, Fed shocks hit the market, I think the markets have become um, overly dependent on central bank communication. Um, now, I, I feel like, you know, markets have been led to the trough, um, but there is a sense of too much certainty you know, central banks depend wanting so much certainty that it kind of reinforces market imbalances. Um, so I don't really. I would probably kind of push back against Charles's. Uh, or let's say I would. I would add a nuance to Charles's comments, which is the market does get it wrong very often. Uh, but I think that's partly because we're trying to follow central bank communication so closely. Um, <laughs> now, I, and, and I. That's not necessarily a criticism of central bank communication. It's just the point that to the extent that the central banks have focused so intensively on making communication clearer, that's coincided with uh, 
what, it, what, what one might call the fall of theory um, and the, the increasing disagreement around um, you know, different aspects of monetary policy and economic theory. So think about the discussion about stock versus flow of QE, very active discussion in, in markets and central banks over which matters more. Markets, I would say, tend to focus more on the flow. Many central banks focus more on the stock. Same on the reversal rate. Um, you know, some would not distinguish between the reversal rate and negative interest rate policy more generally. So the point is when you have that disconnect between what people agree on from a theoretical perspective and central bank efforts to try uh, to be as clear as possible about the, about the communication, ironically, it actually creates, um, it, can, it can create more misunderstanding. Um, the other point I would, I would note is that turning points, I think, are, are very risky. Um, the point about tightenings in short-term tightening and financial conditions and whether or not central banks should look through those, um, I would generally say they, they, they should, and it's not necessarily that harmful. But, you know, again, it's part of that, that question of cost-benefit trade-off in terms of, you know, you may, you may end up with a much faster than desirable mean reversion or overcorrection of imbalances that have built up over the cycle. Um, and I think that that then feeds back to a point which is um, not fully appreciated in markets that, uh, you know, policy is not only kind of uh, adding or reducing accommodation, but it's increasing or reducing volatility. Um, and so those turning points where you've gone through a cycle of suppressing volatility, off, often by design, um, you know, it can be very tricky when you hit a turning point. And that's where I think uh, the addition of additional tools to the monetary policy toolkit, all the macroprudential tools, can hopefully make that transition a little bit easier and make it, uh, you know, easier for central banks to not be so paranoid about, uh, you know, tightening in financial conditions uh, that comes from, uh, you know, unexpected policy moves. Thanks. I think... Thank you. We, shall we get two or three questions and then you can answer? Uh -huh. It's not because we've been praising Benoit's intellectual capacity that nobody can raise a hand for a question. <laughs> Olivier, Olivier. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Good. I was struck by Jeremy's remark that if you move in small steps, then the reaction of a market is going to be bigger. And there seems to be an invariance theorem there. The implication is, or the question is, well, if this is right, is the inertial uh, degree uh, the degree of inertia of the rule that the Fed, for example, seems to be following, the right one, should it not move much faster? I've always been puzzled as to why the adjustment was so slow, but your argument suggests that it is indeed too slow. Uh, would you agree with that or not? Pierre? Uh, Pierre Winch. I'd like to come back to what Charles said, because uh, I guess there is a lot of focus on uncertainty which comes from the communication of uh, central banks. But I guess there is also, at the same time, more and more uncertainty about uh, the efficacy of policies. So on the split between uncertainty from one side, which is communication, and certainly from uh, the impact of policy, um, my guess would be there is more of the second part, or kind. And what does it imply for uh, communication? Yeah. I have a question for Jeremy. Um, as um, central banks have tended over the last 10 years to communicate aggressively on forward guidance, but in reality and real world is more volatile than their own communication, meaning the data depending on the reality you keep on having events. They have a narrative, which is very smooth. So I was interested to see how markets keep on forecasting. It's always a smooth line, always upward sloping like a hill. In reality, it's like a cliff edge, up and down. So do you believe that actually central banks, by keep on having a very smooth narrative, as if they could see in the future, which they don't because nobody can, in reality are creating more instability because if you suppress the real volatility, then you get shock. Okay, I think that we'll move to answer. I, I think 
we, we miss, we're missing one question, which is we're talking about financial condition and the communication, but we're not talking about the channel of transmission between those financial conditions and the real economy and to what extent the ECB actually has managed to impulse uh, the real economy. And I think, Elaine, you went through the mechanism of transmission, so perhaps you could give us the sense um, of how successful or how impaired or why are we not seeing this financial condition being transmitted to the real economy and has it got to do with this feedback loop between the market and the central banks. Who wants to start? Perhaps we should start with Charles. Uh, okay, I'll pick up on, 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 on what you just said because I can add the little thing I didn't have the time to say. Um, the, the, in the dis discussion of whether of why monetary policy seem, and that's also Pierre's question, to have s such a hard time to affect inflation. There have been discussions over for the last 10 years and hypothesis after hypothesis has been tried and then proven wrong, the, the Phillips curve disappearance and all of that. The, the, more recently, my understanding of the discussion is, is about uh, expect inflationary expectations, how sluggish they are, how unanchored they are. And there is a lot of very interesting work uh, by uh, Gorodzichenko and Kwebiu uh, and, and, and others where they, 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 they look at expectations, uh, in fin inflationary expectations in markets and in the non-market private economy. And what they find uh, is that, uh, well, you've seen what, how, how wrong the markets are occasionally. Uh, and uh, and uh, the private sector is completely wrong about the level of inflation, but the private sector is pretty good at forecasting the direction, up or down. Uh, and, uh, and I think there is a deep implication is that um, the, it's the private sector, non-financial private sector, that set prices. Uh, and, uh, and they are amenable to uh, absorbing information from, uh, from central banks or any information, but they don't get it because central banks talk a lot to financial markets uh, in a jargon that most uh, non-financial non people can't understand. And there's a strong point, I think, to be made, and that's where I wanted to end up, for central banks to talk to the private sector, to employees, employers, who set, at the end of the day, set wages and prices and communicate uh, what the central bank sees coming uh, and is trying to achieve. Uh, so that's sort of uh, an important aspect. And on, on Pierre's question, yes, if, if, if there is a, uh, doubts about effectiveness about poli of, of policy, then that's also something that central banks should have, uh, uh, address more openly than I think is currently the case. Thanks. You want to follow up? Yeah, I, I just want to add on, uh, on this uh, very interesting work that in, indeed Koibion and Gornichenko have, um, have, have been doing with um, expectations and survey of expectations of people, households and, uh, and companies. So this is very different from market expectations. And indeed what is, I mean, you could even say almost shocking <laughs> is that in their data at least, people have, a lot of people really do not understand at all even the objective function of a central bank, that is to say a lot of people do not know where is the target uh, and do not know what the target is, and a lot of people um, would, uh, would really think that there are inflation rates which are 10%, whatever, there's a huge distribution of people making very large errors on basic facts. Okay. So if we think that's going to matter for the transmission channel, I mean, we can discuss it because indeed, um, you know, financial intermediation, the experts, etc., are, are, are forming different types of expectations. But uh, that, that's a key issue, and that means there is a failure of central bank communication. Uh, and uh, there's also lab experiments showing that uh, expectations to affect uh, the way people form expectation, one, one thing to... Uh, to emphasize is to do repeated sim simple messages with the basic facts. So that could be something to explore more. I mean, I, I, I don't know, but that's, that's clearly an issue as things stand. And um, now on, on the other point <laughs> that, uh, I, or you want me to delay and to let uh, Jeremy answer because it's, it's more on this topic of. Yeah, perhaps let's do that. Also, I think 
what would be nice as a conclusion, because we need to conclude shortly, is if each of you had just had one sentence for the monetary policy review where you think that the ECB should, should look into. So that, that leaves you time to think, and Jeremy can start with the difficult <laughs> questions. Um, okay, on, on Olivier's question about whether the, the, the extent of gradualism is excessive, um, in this kind of a model, yes. Okay, because basically the market is unwinding, and so the, the attempts at sort of pacifying the market are unsuccessful in equilibrium, and you've just sort of distorted the rate. Now, two caveats to that in the real world. One is you have to believe something about the transmission mechanism. In other words, if you have a sort of classical view, and all that matters for transmission is the long rate, the long rate is kind of going to be what it's going to be no matter what, and you haven't had much of an effect. If you think that the short rate is an important part of the direct transmission mechanism because, say, you believe in a lending channel, then you have moved the short rate away from where it would otherwise ideally be, and then you have compromised something. So that's one caveat. You have to believe that. The other is, of course, there are good reasons for some degree of gradualism, and this is an idea that goes back to Brainard and others, when you're sort of uncertain about the, it's a sort of instrument uncertainty idea, when you're uncertain about how much a funds rate move is going to do, you might want to kind of tap, 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 rather than go, so I, I, you, know, you don't want to take this too much and to say, just because we see some degree of inertia and it's not a random walk, that that's evidence of something wrong. But I think you might sort of, this would lead you to at least be a little bit skeptical about uh, sort of this very, very excessive, uh, sort of extreme gradualism that we see. On the other point about narratives, I think this is like incredibly important. I don't know how to quite formalize it, but you know, data, everybody says data dependence, we're gonna be data dependent. It's a meaningless statement in and of itself because there's an infinity of data. And so unless you sort of are willing to sort of pony up a model that tells you which data is important, it doesn't really have much content. And then this is where I think narratives are very important because I think the narratives or the paradigms or whatever are prone to shift a little bit abruptly. And when they shift abruptly, all of a sudden data that was always there in plain view becomes all of a sudden relevant. So, you know, there was a period, I can't remember if it was 2015 or 2016, there was some bad news out of China, and the Fed was kind of on hold, and all of a sudden, this low R star narrative kind of comes to the fore. Hmm. Well, whatever R star was, it hadn't changed very much in recent months. It's a very, very slow moving variable, but it comes to the fore, and that becomes a dominant narrative. And so I think that's a very interesting, these things don't move, the narratives don't move continuously, so the data that all of a sudden you're drawn to looking at even though the underlying data may be smooth, if you're all of a sudden shifting your attention from one to the other, that's the sort of interesting thing. I think that has not been really kind of analyzed, but I think that's a really sort of centrally uh, important part. Your one cent tip for the ECB review. <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> uh, since my talk was on financial intermediation and transmission, like for focus on how to make transmission better. <laughs> Charles? Uh, we have something about communication. I mean, there should be a, a review of communication. And, uh, and uh, in my view, there should be some thinking about focusing on talking to the plain people who don't understand monetary policy, uh, but set prices. But more importantly, I think there should be a recognition that the control of inflation is not precise, cannot be precise, and having a target of close to but below 2% seems to be a bit more, much more precise that what can be achieved and it, it creates un, unneeded, undeserved difficulties. So I was going to actually uh, echo, uh, echo Charles's point here, and I, I've been thinking about it maybe a little bit more in the context of the Fed's uh, communication review, but. I don't like, and I'm uncomfortable with 2.0 as, as a thing, and then we're gonna have to hit 2.0, and if 1.7, we're failing. I would sort of prefer some kind of zone of indifference so that you know, within that zone, you can, I, th I think first of all, it makes for better communication, and second, you don't um, f force yourself to mechanically do things that are not appropriate for the circumstances of the moment. So for example, if you're at 1.7 inflation, and financial markets are sort of in a normal state, and you want to put more the pedal to the metal to try to get to two, maybe that makes sense. If there's sort of quite a bit of financial market instability, and you're going to add more fuel to the fire, really just to get from 1.7 to two, I think you want to be able to condition on those circumstances and not set yourself 
this sort of overly precise uh, uh, target. And I think that applies probably uh, to the ECB as well. So thank you. I will not make conclusion. They've done it. Uh, and let me thank all the panelists for great insights on communication. Thank you.